come back tomorrow morning. And more importantly, so I get to sleep tonight. <laughs> okay, uh, the first one, it says, Why does Mark 4.12 say, Lest they return and be forgiven? Uh, so let's go there. Mark 4.12. Uh, Mark 4 is the parable of the sower, the first part of it there. It's the first recorded parable of Jesus. And they ask the question, and this other, the second question I've got here is related to it. Uh, in verse 10, it said, well, they get the parable of the sower there is in Mark 4, 1 through 9. And then verse 10, it says, when he was alone, that's Jesus they that were about him with the twelve asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. That seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sin should be forgiven them. So the question is, why does it say, lest they return and be forgiven, uh, in light of 2 Peter 3, 9, which says that God is not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance? Mm -hmm. So I guess the idea is, if God wants all to come to repentance, why would Mark 4, 12 say, I'm going to teach you parables so they don't understand it, because if they understand, they may see, and they may be converted, and their sin should be forgiven them. Uh, the person who asked the question says, possibly the answer is John 12, 40. Uh, let's go there. I like it when the question is already partially answered for me. That makes it easier on me. Uh, because I agree with that. I think that is, when in John 12, 40, it's quoting Isaiah. Isaiah gives a prophecy of the generation that Jesus comes to and Basically, Jesus is saying to the people in John 12 that that prophecy from Isaiah, which is from Isaiah 6, 9, 10, that is fulfilled in the generation where Jesus is at. Uh, so John 12, if you start in verse 37, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That's key to understand that in answering the question, uh, why would he say if he spoke in plain terms, they may return and be forgiven. Uh, first, to understand that they believe not on him. Over in John 1, when John gives a summary of Jesus, it says in verse 11 that he came unto his own, and his own received him not. So Jesus was sent to the law sheep of the house of Israel. He was a minister of the circumcision to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. He came unto them. He did everything he was supposed to do. And John 12, 37 says, they believed not on him. And as a result of that, verse 38, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? And then verse 39 says, therefore they could not believe, because then Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. So I think your answer is there. It's a lot like when Moses goes to Pharaoh in Egypt. There are those ten plagues, and it will say in there, the first plague comes, and Pharaoh says, okay, well, he doesn't say right away, but eventually he says, I'll let Israel go, and then it'll say, he hardened his heart, and that he wouldn't let them go. God sends another plague. Pharaoh hardens his heart. He won't let them go. Then you'll see, it'll say, God hardened his heart. So, you have Pharaoh hardens his heart and says, I'm not going to follow what the God of Israel has told me to do through Moses. I will not let Israel go. And then God sort of helps him down that, that path because he's made that choice already. Well, that's what you have here when you've got John 12, 37, that they believe not on him. 
And so it fulfills the saying, Lord, who hath believed our report? But then you're told, therefore they could not believe on him because he blinded their eyes and hardened their, and, uh, hardened their heart. It's they made the free will decision not to believe the gospel that was presented to them. You, you go back, for example, look at Matthew 3. At the beginning of John the Baptist's ministry, you're told in Matthew 3, verse 1, that John was preaching in the wilderness, and verse 2 says, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then when verse 7, Matthew 3, 7 says, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. John doesn't say, Oh, well, God's going to harden your heart. He doesn't want you to believe, so get out of here. It's the beginning of his ministry. Now, he fills their hearts is that they did not bring forth meat, uh, fruit meat for repentance. They came in an attitude of unbelief. They shut the guy down. That's what they did. But they still have the opportunity. He said, bring forth fruit meets for repentance. Bring forth fruit meets for repentance. He said, you have a chance. I know you don't believe, but you can still believe right now. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and you can still be saved. So the opportunity was there. But by the time you get to the parable phase, that starts in Matthew 13. In Matthew 12, they told Jesus had cast out a devil, and the religious leader said he did it by the power of devils, by the prince of devils, Beelzebub. So because they have already hardened their hearts against God, like Pharaoh did, then God hardens their heart further, as the John 12, 40 passage says. They've already hardened their heart against God. You, when you, when you think of the things of God, I mean, this is powerful stuff. The Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's something that God doesn't want in the wrong hands because it can do damage to God's plan. Let me give you an example of that so you can see what I mean. Look over in 2 Chronicles 33. 2 Chronicles 33 is talking about Manasseh. He was the king, uh, son of Hezekiah. And Manasseh was king over Israel for 55 years, over Judah. And he did a lot of damage. Hezekiah did a lot of great reforms, started to pass over, tore down the, the high places that people were worshiping. That wasn't done by many people before him. He turned the people back to God, and Manasseh went the other way. 2 Chronicles 33, you, there's a lot of verses here. You can see all the evil he did. Uh, verse 4, he built altars in the house of the Lord to other gods. Verse 5, he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. He caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. He observed times, used enchantments, used witchcraft, dealt with a familiar spirit, with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He said, a carved image, the idol which he had made in the house of God. That's what the Antichrist is going to do. Set up a, an image, the image to the beast, in the temple of God. He does all this great harm. Now look at the end of his life. At the end of his life, in verse 15, he took away the strange gods and the idol out of the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem and cast them out of the city. He repaired the altar of the Lord, sacrificed thereon peace offerings and thank offerings, and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. Nevertheless, the people did sacrifice still in the high places, so they're still serving other gods. But notice, yet unto the Lord their God only. What they've done is they've taken a pagan system of Baal worship and Ashtaroth worship, bowing down to the Queen of Heaven and uh, having their children pass through the fire, through the molten hot gods. And, but they're doing it in the name of the Lord their God. They're blaspheming God's name because they're saying they're of God but they're really, they're mixing it with paganism. So, in my opinion, I believe that the reason God hardened Pharaoh's heart, the reason 
God hardens the heart of the religious leaders in Jesus' day to where they cannot believe. Um, the reason God gives the Gentiles over to a reprobate mind at the Tower of Babel, I think things like that show that when they are, they've gotten to the point that if they did turn back to God, they would do it in the context of their religion or their paganism and would just make things worse. They'd end up blaspheming God's name. So, uh, again, that's my opinion on why God does that. He sees, he gives man the opportunity. He's willing, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he gives all the opportunity to be saved. But when it gets to some point, they can end up doing harm for God's kingdom, blaspheming his name. And only God knows that when he, and he says, I'm giving them over to a reprobate mind or I'm hardening their heart. So that was that question. The next question is related to it. Why did Jesus teach in parables? If you go over to Matthew 13. So on the one hand, he hardened the hearts of the unbelievers so they wouldn't believe because they would do the damage because they've already gotten to the point that, they're, that God gives them over to a reprobate mind. And I'm not God, so I don't know how, you know, well, when, when did they get to that point? How did they get to that? I'm not sure. But uh, I think Manasseh is a good example. I think you have a, a combination. The interesting about Manasseh is you've got them worshiping pagan gods in the name of the Lord their God. And then when you get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you don't see them bowing down to Baal, Baal or Ashtaroth or any of those things. But yet, it's paganism in that reli uh, the religion of Judaism. And, of course, Jesus gives a scathing rebuke of them in Matthew 23. I think that conversion of Manasseh led them down to that road and showed the damage that could be done, saying that you're doing all these things in the name of the Lord when you're not. Now, on the flip side for the parables, uh, why did Jesus teach in parables? Most people think Jesus taught in parables to make things easier on you. But it's just the opposite. He spoke in plain language before. You see in Matthew 13, verse 10, after that first parable, it says, The disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them of parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance, but whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. And I think that plays into the question we answered before about why he wouldn't want them to be forgiven, is yeah, the word of God is a powerful thing. We don't want it in the wrong hands. That's why when you come to scripture, no matter how much someone knows the Bible and has answers for anyone's objections, if that person has made up their mind against believing God's word, they will never be convinced. We have to come to the attitude, have the attitude when we come to the God's word of being positive toward God, believing his word, and negative toward what man says, or else we'll never believe it. A lot of these doctrines, foundational doctrines, it's not plain as English in there. Now, if you pick up a Bible for the first time, you want to know how to get eternal life, and all you've got is a Bible... You think, oh, I'll look at the table of contents. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Now that gives you a clue on how to be saved. The Gospels over there, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4, you're 90% through the Bible by that point. How do you find that? It's hidden in there. God hides the book of Proverbs. I think it's chapter 25, verse 1, says this is the wisdom of God to conceal a matter, and it's the glory of kings to search it out. So the reason Jesus spoke to them in parables is Hebrews 11.6 God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. He's not going to make it like a textbook where you say, oh, where's the definition of salvation? Where's the definition of baptism? Where's the definition of life in Christ? You've got jewels hidden all over this, the Bible in different places. That's why we have to cross-reference because God only rewards those who diligently seek Him, those who truly believe Him. And if you don't believe this stuff, it don't matter how good I know the Bible and give you Scripture, uh, it's not going to convince you otherwise. So he spoke in parables to conceal the truth from unbelievers so that they wouldn't bring damage to God's kingdom. Uh, this next question, 
I believe it says, where did the demons go in the flood? Someone wrote that, and I'm not reading that right. You can correct me. Where did the demons go in the flood? So I'm guessing what that means is, we know from Genesis 6, What that's talking about is in Genesis 6 at the flood. <laughs> I'm waiting for people. I hear pages turning. That's why I did it. <laughs> in Genesis 6 2, it says the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. That sons of God is just another reference to angels, in this case fallen angels. The book of Job chapter 1 or chapter 2, you've got Satan and the sons of God coming with him to report to God. So this would be, this is where the idea is there, there are devils out there or demons in Noah's day. So the sons of God would be the fallen angels and the devils. They saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in and took the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. Uh, the Bible says that man was made a little lower than the angels. We read that earlier today in Hebrews 2. And so the angels, if they're fallen angels, they're still mightier than men. So if you've got devil seed mixing with the seed of a human, that's how you get these giants created. And so we know from here it tells you that God, you know, as we know, verse 7, the Lord said, I will destroy man. You know that he brings the flood, destroys everybody, but no one is family. So the question is, what happened with the demons? You go over to 2 Peter 2. And also the book of Jude. 2 Peter 2 and Jude are parallel chapters to each other. A lot of the same information there. And that tells you, even though they were devils, they fallen angels, they rebelled against God. They were still under God's authority. He is still the possessor of heaven and earth. God can stop the devils or Satan or anybody from doing things. And that's why in Job... It's Satan has to go to Job, and he basically has to get permission from God to afflict Job. And when God does say, you can afflict him, then he's, he puts limits on it. He said, well, don't kill him. You can, you can persecute him, but you can't kill him. So God put limits, and apparently these devils had went beyond that limit where they mixed with human seed to create these giants. And God ends up punishing them as a result. 2 Peter 2 2 Peter 2, verse 4, says that for, for if God spare not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell, and deliver them into chains of darkness to be, to be reserved unto judgment. And you know that's, I believe that's a reference to Genesis 6, because the next verse is a reference to Noah's day. It continues that sentence. It says, and spare not the old world, but save Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. So uh, you've got that verse there. Then also in the book of Jude and verse 6. Jude verse 6 says, The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. So... The answer to the question, I believe, of where did the demons go in the flood, I believe they were uh, taken by God, put in everlasting chains under darkness, uh, reserved unto the judgment of the great day. Where, and I don't know what God's going to do. I mean, they're already going to hell, you know, suffer there forever, but apparently they'll get a, there are degrees of punishment in hell, so they evidently would get a worse punishment in hell as a result of this sin. Okay. Next question. Might the serpent in Genesis be something other than a serpent? Also the apple, could it be something else? 
Okay, uh, first off, with the serpent, I believe it's talking spiritually there. There's a verse, I believe it's in the book of Luke, where they talk about, they're talking about, I think it's Jesus is talking about Herod. And he says, you go tell that fox this and that. Well, Herod isn't a literal fox. He's a human being. It was just his character was like a fox. The book of Genesis in chapter 3, and we covered this this morning, said that the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Um, I don't think it's a literal beast. I think that's just a description of the character. Uh, you were in Jude, if you still have that, look in, for example, uh, in Jude, there is a warning against those who are infiltrating the believing remnant of Israel, trying to lead them astray into the Antichrist religion. And it says, for example, in verse 12, it says, These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water. They're not literal clouds. Carried about of winds. Trees whose fruit wither. They're not literal trees. Without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Wave, raging waves of the sea. They're not literal waves. You go back to verse 10. Jude verse 10 says, These speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, and those things they corrupt themselves. Yet they're not literal beasts. But what a brute beast does is all it does is it just operates by instinct. It doesn't make the choice of, I am going to take the moral high ground here and not do that bad thing, or I'm going to have compassion on this person and do something good. The beast just does its instinct. And man has an instinct based upon his sin nature to sin. All that is in the world, 1 John 2.16 says, is the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. If I get rid of, if I... Get rid of my conscience. Don't listen to it. Don't listen to God and His Word. And all I do is follow my own sin nature. And I'm going to do lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. All I'm doing is following the instinct of my sin nature. And here they're called brute beasts. What they know naturally, that's their sin nature, they know that naturally as brute beasts. They're not literal beasts. They're human beings. Because they're eating at their spots of charity there. Uh, their spots in their feast of charity. But in character, spiritually speaking, God calls them beasts because they only follow the lust of their flesh. They don't say, I believe God and His Word. I believe the Gospel. I'm going to be water baptized. You know, they don't go down that road. They're just in unbelief following their own lusts. And so He calls them a beast. So I think the serpent in Genesis 3, that's... That old serpent, the devil, Satan, I believe he's just, he is what he is. He was created in Ezekiel 28 as a cherub that covered the throne of God. So he is, in appearance, that's what he would look like, a cherub. Um, he is, today, 2 Corinthians 11 says he's transformed himself into an angel of light. So he doesn't like who he is. He transforms himself from a cherub to an angel. It was interesting earlier, Richard mentioned about people who are born a certain gender, but they have in their mind who they want to be. I think uh, Satan is your first transgender. He's made as a cherub, but he wants to be an angel of light. Very good. What does that tell you? Anyway, um, no, not a literal serpent, just uh, spiritually. And the apple, could it be something else? I don't want to be here all day, but... Um, I'll tell you, if you look at Judges 9, let me get the, I'll just give you a summary of what it says, and you can read it on your own, but basically Judges 9, verse 7, down to verse 16, there are four trees described there. There's an olive tree in verse 9, a fig tree in verse 10, a vine tree in verse 12, and a bramble in verse 14. 
In the garden, there are four trees. The tree of life, I believe, is the olive tree, type of the Holy Ghost, life in God there. The fig tree, Adam sewed fig leaves together to hide his sin. That would be a type of religion. Then you've got the, uh, the bramble. That would be the thorns and thistles that the ground would build up for Adam under the curse of sin. He'd have to work by the sweat of his brow. So that the thorns and thistles there would be a type of the bramble, the curse of sin. And then that leaves one tree here. That would be the vine tree. And the only other tree mentioned in the Genesis story is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is probably a vine tree to correlate with these four, since you have four in, in Genesis there. So it's probably a grape and not an apple that they ate. Um, if you say, no, no, it's an apple, and you want to believe that, I mean, it's not going to, it's not going to hurt you off with Christ if you t disagree with that. But um, anyway, there you go. Judges 9 would be that one. Okay, uh, pre please briefly explain why I should not attend a Baptist church once I understand the Bible should be divided between Peter and Paul. I am saved. What I would say to that is go over to 2 Thessalonians 5. Um, 1 Thessalonians 5 is what I want to say. Thanks. <laughs> First Thessalonians? First Thessalonians 5, yes. You've got here, you got a lot of short verses. And I loved it as a, as a kid. I went to a Baptist church, actually, and I had to memorize verses. And I, I like this because it was real impressive. I could rattle off nine verses, and I didn't have any words in it. Uh, <laughs> the reason for this is because it's basically summer statements of doctrine that they should already know from the rest of Paul's epistles. He says in verse 16, Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless, unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So basically, he's giving a summary there. If you do these things, then you're going to have a, a sanctified spirit, soul, and body that will be of better use in heavenly places for Christ. So for the person who is saved, you've already recognized your sin, trusted in Jesus' death, throughout and resurrection is atonement for your sin. Uh, if you go to at least a traditional Baptist church, that's what they would teach as the gospel. So you learn that and you have eternal life in heavenly places. Uh, even if you don't understand right division, you've got that. But you know, the question is, you already understand the Bible being divided between Peter and Paul. Why shouldn't you attend the Baptist church? I think a lot of people, and, and I get this with my YouTube videos, because there'll be people who watch and they don't really have a church to go to. All the, the best thing they've got in their area is a Baptist church. So they end up watching my videos, and then, then maybe they believe what, I, what I'm teaching them, but then they're, the, they're like a closet right divider at the Baptist church. They go to the Baptist church there, to, basically because there's fellowship. Now, they can watch my videos and get edified in that, but you can't talk to me face to face. You, you can't have lunch over that. It's just... It's a screen you're looking at. It's an image on the, on the screen there. And so a lot of the big, probably the number one complaint I hear among right dividers is, and there will be people who, if they don't have a right division church in their area, they'll end up going to a Baptist church just because number one complaint is it's a lonely road. It's hard when you believe your Bible and most everybody out there doesn't. It's hard to have fellowship with other people. So they figure, well, among the denominations, the Baptist is the closest, so I'll go with that. Uh, I've tried that before, and it's, it's difficult to hold your tongue sitting in there with some of the crazy, even at a Baptist church, they have maybe better doctrine than other denominations. 
it's still hard to just sit there and then they'll ask you, you know, well, what did you think? And you know, it's like you're putting yourself in a situation where you could, you know, they tell you two things you don't want to talk about are religion and politics. And really, you, you're, a, you're not a religious person, you're a Bible believer. But you're going into a religious environment. And it's a difficult thing to do. And what I've noticed a lot of times, it's like God calls what Israel did, for example, when they're in unbelief, He'll call them being drunk. He'll mention like in Revelation 18 with the mystery Babylon, it says the kings of the earth have taken of the wine of the wrath of the fornication. They drink of that wine. Spiritually speaking, they're drunk. When you are in a, let's say you wanted to go to a bar for fellowship, physically speaking, you said, hey, you know, my friends invited me out after, after work here. Friday night, we're going to go to the bar. Well, you could do that. You wouldn't lose your salvation. You'd be fine. But usually what ends up happening, if you are the, if you're taking the high road and someone else is taking the low road and the two come together, usually the low road people drag the high road person down. Amen. And if you go to a Baptist church, you're safe. You understand the doctrine. It can be easy for you to be dragged down to their level. Now, I read 1 Thessalonians 5 because it tells you, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. You could go to that Baptist church and maybe you would find some sound doctrine in there and be edified in it. But if they're not rightly dividing the word of truth, you probably would get very little. You'd end up with more questions. When you thought you had things clear in your mind, then you end up with more questions. And so, my advice, if you want the very God of peace to sanctify you wholly and for your, for God to have your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You would probably accomplish that better by not going to the Baptist church. And you miss fellowship. I mean, Lana and I do that. We, we're not going to a physical building on Sundays. And sure, I miss not having the people I can talk to, but you got to say, it is your goal to allow Christ to live in you and to be used to a greater extent in heavenly places for all eternity, or is your goal to feel good down here? Paul says, 2 Corinthians 4, 17, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for itself a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That light affliction, Paul was shipwrecked a couple times, he was beaten with rods four times, stone left for dead, uh, and he calls it light affliction. Your light affliction may be being just being lonely, exactly. You don't have friends who believe this. You can't get together with a Bible study, which, by the way, if the Bible studies that I've attended where you get together in a house or a, a restaurant or something, they're not Bible studies. All they are are gospel sessions. And they say, well, oh, yeah, let's pray for so-and-so. They've got cancer. Let's pray for this person. And then they go back and they tell their family, did you know that this person had cancer? Did you know that this person did that? You know, what kind of edification are you going to get there? So, in, in grace, we don't have a rule. Thou shalt not go to the Baptist church. That's not a rule. You don't have that. Our choices are between, usually it's not the good and the bad, but the more mature you get in the doctrine, it's what's the best thing for me to do. And... According to what I read in Scripture, the best thing would be not to associate with a church that does not have at least the basic foundational sound doctrine of life in Christ, clear gospel, right division. If you don't have that, you can prove all things, but there won't be much good to hold fast to. Okay, next question. I'll go to this one. It's related. Can you explain what our roles in heaven will be what will be our purpose there? It's really hard to answer that. There isn't a whole lot of information that I know of. I think when we get there, we'll know a lot better. And these verses that we didn't have a clue about, you know, God will pull it out. You know, one thing I always wonder, and this is just a side note, you've got the scripture for Israel and then the prophecy dispensation. You've got the scripture for us today, Romans through Philemon and the mystery dispensation. What scripture is there for dispensation of the fullness of times, Ephesians 
You might say, well, it's a continuation of what we've got in Paul's epistles. Maybe that's true, but, you know, First Chronicles, the first ten chapters, is just a bunch of names. Maybe there's something hidden there that we'll know in the dispensation of the fullness of times. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. You know, it's just one of those crazy things I think about when I'm up. I'm not, yes, ma'am. Judging angels, the good angels, right? When he says judging angels, we already know the wicked angels, where they're going. So when we right. judge angels in Corinthians, it's the good ones, the ones that are obedient. Yeah, who, yeah, First Corinthians So that's 6. something we'll be doing, right? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to get to that after I quit blabbing. Um, <laughs> First Corinthians six two, yeah. Know ye not, or do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world, and if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Uh, the way I take that passage, uh, you know, God is the judge. We've already seen about how the, the devils who left their first estate, they're in Noah's day, that they're reserved under everlasting chains of darkness. Those fallen angels there, uh, God judged them. I didn't do it. Uh, <laughs> Revelation 12, when we had the third of the angels cast at, with the Satan, they were cast to the earth. I didn't do that. They were already judged by God. I would take this judging angels to be more like, because the context here in verse 1, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints. The context is there's a dispute in the congregation there at Corinth. You know, maybe the, let's say breach of contract. Well, if you, since you're going to be judging angels, you should be able to settle that yourselves without going to a court of law and paying for an attorney and judge deciding what should be done. You should be able to judge these matters if you're going to be judging angels. So I take the judging angels to be a lot like what Moses had the judges do when they were in the wilderness. He appointed judges over groups because Moses, he was, he was hearing these cases all day. People were coming to Moses with all these disputes among each other there. And he appointed judges and then they would go to those judges instead. So I think it's sort of like that. It's just, it's not that you're saying, okay, you're a good angel. You get to stay up here. You're a bad angel. You're going down to hell. I don't think that's what it's talking about. So the context is more the lawsuits among the brethren. I think it's just judging and it matters. And the judging... If you go over to Romans 8, the reason we're going to be judging angels and the reason you need to know the sound doctrine is in Romans 8, 2. Romans 8, verse 2. It says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. This world operates by the law of sin and death since Satan is the God of this world. Heavenly places is going to operate by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And you say, well, what's that? Well, the more you read Romans through Philemon, the more you'll understand how the spirit of life in Christ Jesus works. And so when we talk about those heavenly positions like principalities, powers, mights, dominions, that's over in Ephesians 1 or Colossians 1. Richard wrote up here earlier in Amos 9 where he built up his stories in heaven. That's that governmental structure. But if you've got more of this sound doctrine built up in you, then you would be qualified for a higher level to be able to judge in those things. Just like judges today. There's the district judge court. I don't know the whole structure, but you've got that. And you've got an appeals court. Then maybe you can appeal to the state. And then you can go to the Supreme Court. Those are different levels. The Supreme Court is supposed to know the law better than anybody because they can handle the toughest matters. The, the, the easier ones, you should be able to handle at the lower level, but as, you, as, the, as it gets more complicated, it's harder to figure out how the law applies in that situation. Then you have to go up in higher levels. And so, I would think for the most part, since we do know we're judging angels, and it has to do with those matters that are sort of like courts, I would think thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, those levels... The more sound doctrine you have in your inner man, the more you know how to make decisions based upon the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. 
And so then you would be in a higher position and would get a higher case. Uh, when I say, you know, what we, you know, Richard mentioned how we're not going to be up there playing harps, uh, you know, there are other things I'm sure that we'll be doing. Over in uh, Chronicles, First Chronicles, you've got the different positions that David created, the course of the priests, the course of the mu musicians, all these different courses. I wouldn't doubt that we've got something like that in heavenly places. You look at the beast and the elders, I mean, they're falling down and worshiping the Lord the whole time. Uh, they're in Revelation 4 or Revelation 5. How do we worship the Lord? Is it by an operating by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus? I believe so. Other things are just showing God's love. God getting glory through that. Other things are um, bowing down and worshiping Him. There is just all kinds of things like that. It's, it, and I say it's hard to say because it's all spiritual. We have to walk by faith and not by sight. And I do good to learn little things that happen in this world I don't understand. Uh, see, you know, figuring out what's going to happen in the spirit realm, I can only go by Scripture. And right now, because of that, and I'm not there right now, um, I think a lot of these verses are just going to be really opened up for us when we get there, uh, more so, in more detail, I should say. Okay, uh, why does God categorize sin? Knowing Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Some sins leading to death, some sins not leading to death. Seems like some sins are based on motive and severity. That's what it says. Uh, God doesn't really categorize sin. Churches do that. The Catholic Church says there are seven deadly sins. Well, the wages of sin is death. If you go to James 2... James 2, God really puts all the sin at the same level. It says in verse 10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the whole law. Now we in our minds think, well, killing somebody is worse than a lie. Well, in God's eyes, spiritually speaking, you are a sinner and deserving of hell if all you do is lie as the, and the other person is all they do is kill people. Either way, it's the same. Now, having said that, there are certain sins that have a greater consequence. Sin is really in the heart. Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, the evilness proceeds out of the man's heart, and that's what defiles the man, not what comes into him. And so, in God's eyes, you sin at that point in your heart. But when you put it into action, then there are going to be natural consequences as a result. And, for example, the lie, I could hurt somebody's feelings, and maybe that's all that ever happens. But if I actually kill somebody physically, that creates a whole greater consequence in the natural world, the material world, than just the little lie that hurts somebody's feelings. So, there are different consequences. Also, I should mention, if you go to 1 Corinthians 6, if you do want to say that God categorizes sin, I think this is your best argument for a uh, sin. He says here basically that fornication, which would be any sexual sin, is in, in a sense it's worse than any other sin that could be done because it says there in verse 18, 1 Corinthians 6, 18, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body or outside the body. Mm -hmm. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. It's, uh, sexual sin can have worse spiritual consequences than any other sin because, not that it's any worse or that it's going to make you to go to hell a lot faster. It's just be because all sin is a transgression of the law. But it's just, you're sinning against your own body. That's the only sin you can do against your own body. Mm -hmm. 
It's interesting in Romans 1 when you see the downward spiral of sin where they became vain in their imaginations and then they get to the reprobate mind. The first sin that you see is sexual sin with the opposite sex. Then you see sexual sin with the same sex. It's interesting that, and I think that's why the society is so sexually charged because Satan knows that that's a tool that, can use, that he can use to greater deprivation of the person. Again, not that any sin is worse in terms of going to hell or not, but um, the sinning is, sexual sin is the only sin against your own body. Okay, next question. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. Let's go over there. The question is, why do some verses seem to indicate that man can lose their salvation? Hebrews 6, 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again into repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put Him to an open shame. Uh, the reason some verses seem to indicate that man can lose his salvation is because that's true. In Israel's program during the last half of the tribulation period, they can lose their salvation. That, I mean, that's what it says. In Acts 2.38 it says, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So for Israel at the Anaheim phase of the kingdom, the only way they receive the Holy Ghost is if they believe the gospel of the kingdom, repent and be baptized. So in Hebrews 6, 4, when it says they were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, then that means they must have been saved. In other words, they must have repented and were water baptized. They uh, believe the gospel of the kingdom. And so if it's impossible, verse 6, to renew them again into repentance, then they were saved people, and then they lost their salvation. Perhaps that's a bad term to use to say they were saved people. Um, it's not that God remitted their sins and just took them back. Um, first off, understand that Hebrews, or Matthew 24, 13, which is on here, Hebrews is written to the Hebrews. It's not written to us today. Romans 5.11 says that we have the atonement now. Romans 5.9 says we have been justified by His blood right now. The moment today in the dispensation of grace that you trust in Jesus' death, your own resurrection is atonement for your sins. You receive the gift of eternal life. At that moment, you cannot lose it. You receive the seal of the Holy Spirit. It will never be taken away from you. This, Hebrews 6, is talking about a special circumstance. This falling away... If you go over to Revelation 14, the falling away is a reference to bowing down to the image of the beast or taking the mark of the beast. That's why I say it can only be committed in the last three and a half years of the tribulation period because that's the only time when, uh, when this is in effect. In Revelation 14, verse 9, it says, The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So the reason I know that falling away in Hebrews 6.6 6 is a reference to taking the mark or worshiping the image of the beast is because Revelation 14.9-11 says that if anyone does that, they will suffer forever in a lake of fire. I think what happened is Satan got a little smart because God created an eternal security program for the body of Christ and Satan says, I want in on that. And so he creates his own eternal security program, eternal damnation in the lake of fire. They are, and that's why it says they would have to, uh, in Revelation 6, 6, it says they crucified to the Son of God afresh. 
put him to an open shame. They have publicly denied the Lord Jesus Christ by taking the mark. They're pledging their allegiance to an antichrist by taking the mark or worshiping the image of the beast. And that is Satan's eternal security program in the lake of fire. So that's, that's what I believe is the only instance where they can lose their salvation is by their allegiance to uh, the devil through the mark or the image. And that's why you have the scripture like they could fall away or Matthew 24, 13, one who endures, he shall be saved. Uh, one final point on that, there are passages, there's one mentioned here, 1 Timothy 1.19 on the question that they've uh, suffered shipwreck in regard to faith. Uh, let me cover Galatians 5. This is probably the biggest one that is used to say that you can lose your salvation today. Galatians 5. Verse 1, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. But they'll use that term to say, Oh, you've fallen... Yeah, you're not under law, you're under grace, but you can fall from grace so you can lose your salvation. Yeah. And there are, there are passages in Paul's epistles that he says things that you think, oh, well, I can lose my salvation. What you have to understand is when you're talking about salvation, it doesn't necessarily mean salvation from hell. It could be a salvation from a sinful lifestyle. It could be, and usually... When you get to Romans 5, you, if you've understood the first five chapters of Romans, you understand in the first three chapters that you're a sinner. You've understood that Christ died for your sins. He is the fully satisfying sacrifice for your sins. You've understood to trust in Him to be, and that you are justified by faith without works. And in chapter 5, you understand that you've now received the atonement and you've now been justified by His blood. So that is, if you've got Romans 1 through 5 doctrine in your inner man, you already know that you have eternal life in heavenly places. It cannot be taken away from you. And Paul, from that point on, builds upon that knowledge. And when he uses terms like this in Galatians, he's not saying if they fell from grace that they, are, they have lost their salvation. What he's saying is, you have liberty, verse 1 says, you have liberty in Christ, you are under that law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. But then, someone came along and you believed in verse 2 that you need to be circumcised. You're not under the law, you're under grace. But now you've decided in your own flesh to put yourself back under a law that you don't have to do. So if you put yourself under the law, verse 3, I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. It doesn't mean that Christ's blood does not atone for your sins. You've already learned the doctrine of eternal security from the first five chapters in Romans. God's word is true. So you've learned that from the first five chapters. So when you get to a verse, whenever you get to a verse in Paul's epistles that appears to say that you lose your salvation, you need to be positive toward God and negative toward man and say, I know that can't be what it means. I don't know what it means yet, but I know it can't be saying I could lose my eternal life, my salvation, because I'm trusting in the truth that God revealed to me in the first five chapters of Romans. And so, even if you don't understand it, it's okay. We don't all understand it, and we're not going to all understand it. That's what we're going to spend eternity in heavenly places for. Keep learning the doctrine. And basically what he's saying here, you were under the law before you were saved, it was your schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. Now that you're justified by faith, God takes you from being under the law, He puts you under grace. And then you, in your flesh, decided to go back to the law. Well, then you've fallen from that grace position. Not losing your salvation, but you're not allowing the grace of God to work in you. You are trying to live like you did before you were saved. The law taught you 
that you can't serve God because in your flesh dwells no good thing. You learn that lesson, you believe the gospel, and then some religious person came along and got you to go back to the law. So you don't lose your salvation. So whenever you come across a verse in Paul's epistles that appears to say that you <coughs> lose your salvation, tell yourself, I know God's word in Romans 1 through 5 that I'm eternally secure in Christ. I'm still with the Holy Spirit. I've got the atonement now. That verse can't possibly mean that. And then read the context and try to figure it out. And if you don't figure it out, that's okay. At least you know that it's not saying you can lose your salvation. Yes, sir? I heard what I said. You don't lose your salvation, but you can walk away from your salvation. Okay, you've heard that you lose your salvation, no, no. but it, you don't lose your salvation, but you can walk away. You can walk away from your salvation. Go to 2 Timothy 2. I, I think this is the clearest verse to me that shows your salvation is secure. That's, uh, that's what they say about Demas. When they said, Demas has forsaken me. Yeah, Demas has forsaken me, loving the present world. Yeah, yeah they right. Walked away from that's what I've heard. And right. I, I heard that. No, 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 I understand. I, I grew up in a church that taught you do a sin, you lose your salvation, you gotta get saved. So I understand that perspective. That's why I say they need to go back to Romans 1 through 5 and believe what that says. Look at Colossians 3 and 2 Timothy 2. As we could spend several hours going through every single verse and trying to show it, but th this is the bottom line, is in Colossians 3, verse 3, it says, Ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. So if I, I can't choose to walk away from my salvation, because I'm dead, a dead person can't walk. I am, and the but I have life. My life is hid with Christ in God. Galatians 2.20 says Christ is, no, I'm sorry. The next verse says, when Christ who is our life shall appear. So, you have a transformation, a change in identity once you are saved. Once you believe the gospel, you are taken out from being an Adam, and you are placed into Christ. And you are dead. So if someone says, well, Demas hath forsaken me, love in the present world, okay, He's not allowing Christ to live in him. But he couldn't lose his salvation because he's dead. A dead man can't take himself out of something. And the second Timothy 2, I think, shows that as well. Verse 13. Because your salvation is dependent not on your works, but it's upon belief. Belief. You recognize you're a sinner. You believe that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again as atonement for your sin. God gives you the gift of eternal life. And so the worst thing you could do in terms of spiritually speaking after you're saved is not to go be a mass murderer because God's forgiven those sins. It's just to stop believing. To say, yeah, I believed that gospel back then, but um, I've got new life from my friend at this church and he's shown me differently and so I believe that I could work my way to heaven. I, I don't need Christ's sacrifice. Unbelief is the worst way to just a minute. In verse 13, 2 Timothy 2.13, it says, If we believe not, these are people who have already believed the gospel. And he says, if, ye, if we believe not, yet he, that's Christ, abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Because your life is hid with Christ and God and ye are dead. Even if you choose to just walk away and say this Bible stuff is a bunch of malarkey. I don't believe Jesus Christ ever lived. I don't believe any of that stuff. I've changed my mind. I've decided not to believe. It's too late. i got to go to heaven anyway. Because my life is hid with Christ and God. And Christ abides faithful. God cannot deny Christ salvation. Because he earned it. And I am in Christ, so he can't deny me salvation. He would have to send, God would have to send Christ to hell in order to send me to hell once my life is hit with Christ. It wouldn't be hell anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It wouldn't be hell anymore. It, yes, you had a question the first time I get to yours, Lynn, after that. No, I just, that's just a carnal saying. That's just somebody who's carnal. They don't yeah. want to be spiritual, and they don't care about the, you know, um, God rewarding us by being faithful. They just want to be kind. I just want to have fun. I just want to just live so like God I was saying, the Yeah, they're just kind of. That's your flesh. The lust of your flesh. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Because you are. You're stepping out of this a kind of Christ. Thing in you. 
That's the lust of the flesh. I'm going to do that, that, that. If right. you're God's child and you have the Holy Spirit within you, you'll get that check. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of the issue when you come across people who say you have to do works or you have to avoid sin or whatever to maintain your salvation, when you tell them eternal security, they'll tell you, but God didn't save you. He saved you from that life you were living, and He wants to live, you live a new life in Christ. And that's true. God does want you to allow Christ to live in Him, to get the sound doctrine in the inner man, to allow God's love to come through you. That's absolutely true. But that's a separate issue from your salvation. Definitely. Yeah, and, and that's what they don't they don't get. Yeah. Uh, again, it's it's like I said this morning. I think it was, or maybe in, in the question and answer. If you don't want to believe, you're not going to believe. You can believe whatever you want to believe, and you can use scripture to support that, taking it out of context and twisting it around to believe whatever you want. And I can tell you from the comments I get on YouTube, there's at least a hundred verses out there that can be used to say you can lose your salvation. And no matter what I tell them, they are not going to believe that they can't lose their salvation. That they can't lose their salvation. Which I don't understand that because I grew up in a situation like that, and it was a terrible childhood trying to always confess my sin and get saved and then lose my salvation and get saved. Why would anybody want to go to that? I've been freed from that. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where Christ has made us free. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. I know what that yoke of bondage is like. Why would I try to pull people who are free in their liberty in Christ into that yoke of bondage? It's, it's the flesh. That's the answer to the question. But, uh, okay. Uh, Ephesians 1.3 What are the spiritual blessings... Do we have access to them now? Uh, the spiritual blessings, uh, a lot of that, it's short answer, Colossians 2. i got to say short answers because I've been up here an hour. <laughs> Colossians 2. Verse 2, Colossians 2.2. 2 that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Your short answer to what your spiritual blessings are is the mystery of Christ, the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We think of treasures as money. You know, the more money I have in my pocket, the richer I am. Spiritually speaking, you know, the green bill that says Federal Reserve no longer would do me a bit of good in heaven. Uh, it is the true treasures, spiritual treasures, are the wisdom and knowledge that are hid in Christ. And those, and if you look at Ephesians 2, verse 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and His kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. The more sound doctrine you have built up in your inner man, the more you have mined the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that are hid in Christ Jesus, the more riches God can pour upon you spiritually speaking because you can understand. It's sort of like, I remember years ago I saw an episode of some kind of, I don't know, it was on HGTV or something where they had, they went to Detroit and there were a lot of impoverished areas. They bought this house next to nothing and it was somebody that was living in there and they couldn't afford the payments and so then they rebuilt it, made it completely brand new and just gave the house to the people that were living there and they ended up being evicted because they didn't pay the utility and the water and the other bills. They don't have a mortgage. I mean that's exceeding riches of grace that you would give a stranger a fully paid for house. I wish somebody would do that to me. But they couldn't appreciate it. They didn't have the financial wherewithal, I guess, the, the wisdom to know how to spend their money. Or, you know, I don't know the situation, but the bottom line is you're given a free house and you can't even enjoy it because you don't have the wherewithal to enjoy that. That's what the spiritual blessings are, and that's why the more sound doctrine you have in your inner man, then the more treasures of wisdom and knowledge that you mind. And the more God can pour His grace upon you in the ages to come. And so, 
uh, I can't really quantify the spiritual blessings more than that. But uh, it just means get that sound doctrine in the inner man and uh, enjoy it in the ages to come. And then the next question is like that, Ephesians 3, 8. What are the unsearchable riches of Christ? Ephesians, in the context is the mystery in verse 3. Ephesians 3, 3. How that by revelation he made known unto the me unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words. And then in verse 8, unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. I think the word unsearchable is there because it was hidden. He says it was a mystery. It wasn't revealed until given to the Apostle Paul. Folks, the, the prophets in the Old Testament, we're told over in Peter, it says they wrote down the things, the sufferings that would happen with Christ and the glory that should follow. They wrote that stuff down. And they searched and they had no idea what the sufferings, how would they be saved? It says over there in Peter, they searched diligently those scriptures that they wrote down themselves and they couldn't figure out how they would be saved. And Peter says, it was revealed unto them that you're not going to know because you're not far, uh, far enough along in the progressive revelation stage. It's going to be given to the to Israel at the ad hand phase of the kingdom to understand how that salvation is accomplished. It's not for the Old Testament people. The same thing with the mystery then. The unsearchable riches of how Christ would save the Old Testament prophets, it was unsearchable because even though they wrote it down, they needed the Holy Ghost to teach them the things of God and what they wrote down. And it wasn't time yet for that to happen. So the unsearchable riches of Christ is simply the, the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that are in Christ are the riches, and they were unsearchable until given to Paul. But now we've got the Holy Ghost, we've got God's completed word, and we can mine those treasures now. Okay, last one, and this is a long one. Let's see. Uh, is it not so that the words of Christ in red, especially in the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, before the crucifixion and resurrection pertain to the Jews and the kingdom message and not to the present church. And that the blood of a new covenant symbolized by the wine at the Last Supper is that very same blood that he shed the following day. Well, let me just stop and answer the first part. Uh, okay. Words of Christ in red are not to us today, they're to the Jews not to the present church. Yes, that is true. Now, it doesn't mean you're not for it. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. You know, we've, in this conference, we've gone through Old Testament passages. We've gone through verses in Hebrews through Revelation. There are treasures of wisdom and knowledge that are hidden in those. But Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, 7, Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. So you have to understand at least basic foundational doctrine from Paul's epistles before you'll understand the other things outside of Paul's epistles. But they, the other part of Scripture is still profitable. People will accuse right dividers of, well, we only follow Paul's epistles and we throw the rest of the Scriptures out. And it's actually just the opposite. The people who accuse you of that usually are only following the red letters of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they don't, and they throw the rest out. I mean, I can give them explanations of some of these things in Leviticus and why it was there that they wouldn't have a clue on. And it's not that I'm smarter than them, it's just because I've considered what Paul said, and I rightly divide the word of truth. I didn't throw out Leviticus, I understood some of those things. But yet those people who accuse me of throwing out the rest of the Bible outside of Paul's epistles, they've thrown out Paul. They've thrown out Hebrews, well, they, they still follow Hebrews to Revelation. They've thrown out the Old Testament. So, uh, but, so all of it is for you, but it's not all to you, was my point there. And as far as the Synoptic Gospels being to the Jews, pertaining to them only, if you look at Romans 15, 8, Romans 15, 8 says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, that's the Jews, 
for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. And then once that happens, then, verse 9, the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. So, and Matthew 15, 24, Jesus says, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So, uh, the words in red are, Jesus came to Israel. Israel was then to go to the Gentiles, and that was Israel's program. Since Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, then yes, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was written to Israel for their program, not to us today. But again, you can still get profit from that area. Okay, the next part, the blood of the new covenant symbolized by the wine at the Last Supper is that very same blood that he shed the following day. The blood of the Lamb, Israel's rejection, is the same blood of the New Covenant Church. There may be, you know, I don't know how all that worked, to be honest with you. I know in John 6, Jesus says, If you do not eat my blood and drink my, or eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. He said that twice there. So they need to eat his flesh and drink his blood to have part in them. How that works, I can't tell you. It's certainly not. Did you have something? I know. I, if you read in first, if you read the Gospel of John, it says the Word became flesh. The Word became flesh. To eat His flesh, that means you got to eat His Word. Oh, that's good. good. Yeah, that's. A, I was going to get yeah, to to eat His flesh, eat His Word. Yeah, I was going to get. It's probably some kind of spiritual thing working out there. That's very good. Yeah. Uh, but is it the very same blood that He shed the following day? And again, you know, it's interesting about the blood of Christ is that they drank, they, he had the Passover with them, and he said, this is the blood of the New Testament that's shed for you. If you take that literally, then they did drink that blood of the next day. But if you take it spiritually, then they didn't. Um, you've got a passage like 1 John 5, which will say the blood and the water and the Spirit are our witnesses on the earth that Jesus is the Christ. And when Jesus' side was pierced, blood and water came out. The next thing on here is, as man was created from the dust of the earth, Christ shed at the cross his blood onto the dust of the earth to make it available to man to redeem himself. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good point. There is so much depth and riches in God's word Amen. and so much symbolism that you can draw um, you know, again, I, I can't stand up here and say conclusively what's true, you know, what symbolizes what, but uh, I think that's a good guess. And there's probably, that shed blood and exactly, everything happened for a reason and for a purpose, and if you're told that it happened, then there's got to be a reason. I mean, God doesn't just put words in here to fill it up to make His Bible a long book. He only puts what in, is in here necessary, and so if He tells you that the blood fell and hit the dust to the ground. Uh, there's a reason he did that, and to me that sounds like a, a plausible reason. All right. That's it for me. Yeah. You're up.